Hi there, Richard Millen here for US Squash. You know, squash has been around in its current form for about 140 years, and I've been lucky enough to be involved for nearly 50 of those 140 years. I've been involved in squash as a student, a competitor, a referee, a coach, a writer, and more recently, as a television commentator. You know, television potentially could be the greatest opportunity for growth and development that squash has ever had. But to do that, it's really important that the people watching understand the terms that the commentators are using. This video and those that follow are intended to help you, the viewer, and us, the commentators, more fully enjoy the tactics, strategy, skills, techniques, successes, failures, fitness, and the entire wonderful world of squash, so that in the end, we all understand what's being done by these amazing athletes. I hope that you find these videos helpful, but please, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me at milmansquash at gmail.com with any questions. Thanks so much. When we describe squash, our task is to describe the skills, techniques, physicality, successes and failures that go on in a game of squash. Not only to describe them, to, but to explain the reasons why these things happen. So squash is played on a court that is 32 feet long from the front to the back and 21 feet wide and the ball must be kept below the red lines and the outer court line is 15 feet at the front, sloping diagonally to 7 feet at the back. The ball must hit the front wall before it hits the floor. The ball must only bounce once, it can be taken in the air. When serving, one foot must be clearly in the box and you must strike the ball above the service line, which is that middle line over here. It's got to be kept above the tin. For professionals, the tin is 17 inches. For amateurs, the tin is 19 inches. These restrictions and the limited area of the court mean that a great athlete who's skilled with their techniques can retrieve almost any ball. Think about that for a moment. These restrictions mean that you can't simply find a way to play a winning shot. Your assumption has to be that your opponent will retrieve every shot you play. And so there needs to be patience and strategy in gradually maneuvering the opponent out of position. If you try and finish the point and don't think about your own security, your opponent will retrieve the ball and find you out of position. If, on the other hand, you assume that your opponent is definitely going to get it back, you know that you've got to be in position for their return, and so you plan ahead for that eventuality. reason, time is the most precious commodity in squash. If you like, it's the dollars and cents of squash. If you commit too much of your time to an attack without considering your own situation after the attack, you will find yourself behind the game. So whenever you design a shot, your first consideration has to be, where do you want to put yourself? And only if you're in a position of strength can you afford to attack the opponent. And this is my white board. And I'm taking a big black marker 
and I'm drawing a line along here, and on the end of the line, I've got an arrow. And at this end of the line, I'm writing the word future. And in the middle of the line, I'm drawing a picture of the ball, and I'm going to write underneath the ball, present. And at this end of the line, the beginning of the line, I'm going to write past. The ball is always in the present. That's where the game is. A great player, mentally and physically, is getting further down there into the future. A beginner player chases after the ball and puts themselves in the past. What we see with great professionals is the techniques, strategies, physicality that allow them to get up here into the future. There are multiple factors that affect the management of time. The way you strike the ball, how fit you are, your choices and selections, your understanding of philosophy. All of these factors affect your ability to survive. And squash, effectively, is like life. The most important priority is survival. And how you conduct yourself, how you prepare yourself, all of these things affect your ultimate survival. Fundamental movement technique is the most important of all the factors. The ability to not only get to the ball, but as you're on your way to the ball, already considering where you're going to move in order to be able to defend all possible shots that the opponent can play. To develop excellent movement technique, a player must repeat movements hundreds of thousands of times until they're automated. It's not just a question of running. There is a particular method of defending the court. For instance, if I move to the front of the court and play a shot to the back of the court, as I recover, I have to maintain my right foot on the right side and my left foot on the left side in order to be able to defend the whole court space. If I play a shot at the front of the court and I turn round, my opponent can easily hit the ball past me and I can't defend the court. So, learning how to orchestrate these movements to be able to choreograph the movement to defend the court is imperative. In commentary, some of the terms that we might use to describe these movements are words such as move off the ball. What does that mean? Well, what that means is when a player approaches to play a shot, that they load their legs so that as they hit the ball, they can be on the way away from the shot. Now, although they're going to move away from the shot, they also have to retain a connection with the ball. So if I get the ball out and I hit a shot, as the ball progresses from my racket down the court, you'll see that I'm not only moving off to defend the whole space, but I'm also staying connected physically, mentally, emotionally with the ball. Here's an example. So that attention to the ball is paramount, but simultaneously I'm defending the whole court, and in my mind I have a blueprint of the court which I automatically can feel. I never allow my primary focus to leave the ball. My peripheral awareness is what looks after my understanding of where I am on the court. Here I say that he was late off the ball. This is what happens when a player, instead of loading and organizing the legs to be able to come off the ball as he hits it, hits the ball first and is still moving as the ball comes back down the court. Obviously, this is not a good time management technique. You always want to be ready for your opponent's next shot before the opponent could possibly play it. And if you are late off the ball, you are still going to be busy trying to get back into position when the opponent is intercepting the next shot. 
Sometimes you'll hear us talk about somebody who's playing on arrival instead of playing on departure. What does that mean? Well, if the player comes in to play a shot on arrival, the ball comes off their racket before they start leaving. Obviously, as soon as the ball's been struck, the opponent wants to come in and hit the next shot. So if I play on arrival, it's going to create interference between me and the opponent. As the opponent comes in, I'm still on my way out. On the other hand, if I play on departure, I have already created a position for myself for the next phase of the round, long before the opponent comes in to get the next shot. When players get tired, they tend to start playing on arrival, and that's when they stay and block, and we see penalties and interference. So in general, movement is all about organizing and planning movements to put you in position before the opponent can possibly play the next shot. Your physical fitness, your fundamental movement technique, these things contribute to your ability to be in a good position, ready ahead of the timeline. Another term that we use a lot is the word fundamentals. And I realize that fundamentals, although they're basic sounding, are actually very complex and not everybody understands what they are. I've just described the fundamentals of movement. The second most important fundamental is racket technique. The racket is an amazing thing for a squash player when properly used. It's kind of a crystal ball because the human mind is such that if I prepare a racket, my subconscious is triggered to start visualizing and accurately calculating the behavior of the ball and what I must do to intersect with the ball to design the shot that I want to play. In commentary, you'll often hear us talk about late prep. What does that mean? Well, if an opponent is asked to go into the front corner, if they start running without prepping the racket, the mind starts following the ball, starts chasing the ball. There is no planning or organization for the future. On the other hand, if when the player is asked to go to the front corner, their first response is to prep the racket, immediately they start triangulating with brilliant mathematics as to how to approach to be able to set up the design shot, and not only how to approach, but also how to move off the ball for correct movement technique. So you can see that the racket preparation is essential if the mind is going to operate ahead of the timeline. And any time a player starts running without preparation, they end up chasing the game and not planning the game. So, try and remember, prep before you step.